Good to have your company. Next guest on the program, Liberal Senator James Patterson here in the studio. Thanks for your time. Always a pleasure, Tom. Boris Johnson uh, getting a lot of attention, uh, his uh, well, rise now to the Prime Ministership of Britain. A lot of talk about him. Uh, he says he wouldn't be the man he were unless he'd come to Australia. What's it going to mean for Australia, his uh, leadership? I have to confess, Tom, I'm a little bit excited uh, about Boris becoming the British PM. Uh, he is a great friend of Australia. In fact, the AFR called him an Aussie file uh, in, the, in the paper today. And uh, Senator James McGarr and I are informally starting a parliamentary Friends of Boris and Brexit, so we're seeking applications for any colleagues who are watching. Um, they're very welcome to join. Um, it, it's really exciting for Australia because he, he really does, he's spent a lot of time here. He cares about the relationship with Australia and with the Commonwealth broadly. And I think Brexit is an unprecedented opportunity to really restore those ties uh, with a free trade agreement, with better migration options. It's really exciting time. Is it a bit unusual to align yourself with a policy, within a domestic policy of another country like that? Well, I spoke out publicly about Brexit uh, prior to the vote. I was an advocate of Brexit prior to the vote. I did a speech in the Senate chamber on it. Um, other uh, colleagues uh, spoke out and said that they would prefer that Britain remained within the EU. I think it was a matter that... Um, you could, uh, free to speak as a backbench, I basically. think so, yeah. Right. Um, let's get through a couple of the issues of the day. Retirement income review is happening. Mm. But in the uh, question time today, you were over in the Senate, in question time, Josh Frydenberg was asked to rule out any changes to the legislated increase, and he did so. Mm. Should that consideration of how an increase works be part of the income review? Well, the government's been very clear from the Prime Minister to the Treasurer to the Finance Minister that it has no plans uh, to change the superannuation guarantee increase scheduled to start from 2021 up to 12%. Um, that doesn't mean, in my view, that the review shouldn't question that uh, and look at that issue because so the Productivity Commission has explicitly said that if we are going to increase our superannuation guarantee to 12%, then we must do a review of the retirement income system to make sure that it's working and to see what the long-term implications are. So when we have is. those terms of reference, though, they should include looking at that and whether or not increasing it is a good idea overall? My general view with these reviews, Tom, is that they should be free to canvas far and wide. That doesn't mean the government is going to do everything that sure, a review Sure, but it should be free to and say increasing this is not a good idea, full stop, or at this time. Well, in this instance, the government's made clear what its view is, and I doubt that, that a review would change that uh, point of view, because that's what they very clearly said this week. But I don't think there's any harm for a reviewer to have a look at an issue like that. And, and be free to have that sort of recommendation? Well, I mean, a review can make any recommendations it likes mm. and the government will consider them. But if you want to... If it has the ability to say, hey, increasing super to 12% is not a good idea now or whatever it might be, uh, that's the government... Because it's asking the review to happen. There's no point in asking it to look at that unless the government would be willing to have an open mind on that. Well, I think we should look at the evidence, Tom, and the evidence, whether it's from the Productivity Commission, the Grattan Institute, Treasury or anyone else who's ever looked at this, if you increase the superannuation guarantee, it comes at the expense of take-home wages, and that's a careful balancing decision that we have to take. Do we think it's right to sacrifice people's take-home wages now for a secure, more secure retirement in the future? And does indeed it mean a more secure retirement in the future? That's one of the things that Grattan has actually questions. Uh, speaking of wages, we've had a lot of cases over the past few years of underpaid workers or wage theft. What's the government actually done over the past few years, and has it been a big enough priority? Well, one of the things we've done is we've increased the funding for the Fair Work Ombudsman, who's the body responsible for investigating uh, these issues within the Fair Work Commission, and they're the ones who've, who've come out with this finding on George Columbaris, which has been in the media this week. But you're right, it is a widespread problem. In fact, one of the organisations that confessed to potentially underpaying up to 2,500 of its employees is the ABC. Uh, 2,500 of its casual employees, they believe they might have underpaid. One employee, potentially up to $19,000. Now, mm. The ABC is not a rapacious, profit-seeking corporation, no. uh, so I think that does point to potentially some wider issues about the complexity of awards and something I think we should look at. Is complexity an excuse? I mean, shouldn't you be able to get a good enough piece of software if your company is that big, get the right Excel spreadsheet or whatever it is? There's no excuse for an employer ever underpaying a worker for any reason, and if they do, they should be punished for it. But I think it is important to distinguish between people who are deliberately going out and doing that and people who are innocently making a mistake. And mm -hmm. if they are innocently making a mistake, on a repeated basis across a whole range of industries, across a whole range of businesses, then I think it's our job to look at what's causing those mistakes and can and we make it more straightforward. And criminal charges, possibly? I think that should be reserved for those very rare instances of repeated, deliberate theft from workers, because that's what it is. Um, that might be appropriate. Uh, can I just ask you, on the Administrative Appeals Tribunal review, mm -hmm. uh, one of the recommendations says only lawyers should sit on it, not former politicians. Is it time to end that gravy train? 
Well, Ian Callanan is one of Australia's most eminent uh, living lawyers and another eminent lawyer, Christian Porter, will be considering that report carefully. I confess I haven't read it yet, um, and I, but I will be taking an interest in it, as I'm sure a lot of my colleagues will, um, mm -hmm. because the function of the AAT is actually very important to our administration of our legal system, our justice system in Australia, and particularly our migration system. There's been uh, many decisions which have frustrated the government and others uh, in the AAT, and just the length of time uh, and, and delays involved in some of those migration decisions need but, to be We've all seen the lists when they're released on who's appointed to these uh, tribunals and basically it's spot the former poly. Is that a bad look? Oh, I think that's a little bit uh, unfair. Tom, sometimes there are certainly former political uh, people with political experience who are appointed um, and it's something that's happened under un un governments of both persuasions. But, and it's uh, almost always that government appointing people formally within their party in some form of government. Well, I, I can right. think of instances where um, our government has appointed former Labor politicians and uh, Labor figures to, to the AAT. And I think... The percentage is pretty skewed though, right? Well, I think that, that certainly having legal qualifications is important, but the Act does allow for people with other areas of expertise to be appointed. And there are some areas within the AAT's work where other expertise might in fact be more relevant than legal expertise uh, in the Social Security Division, for example, and understanding of the Social Security system and all its complexity. It's actually a very useful set of skills to have. So you'd like to see politicians still be able to be appointed, not a blanket ban? Well, I'm not going to preempt the government's response. We've released the report. It's mm. up to Christian Porter. But, but do you have a response. view? I mean, this is what they've come out and said. No, I don't have a strong view. I'm, I'll be watching closely what Christian Porter says. All right, James Patterson. I might just ask you finally uh, mm. about uh, religious freedoms. So the indication from Christian Porter today uh, around where he's going to go on this. What's your latest take on this? I know you've had some views in the past. Yeah, well, I'm bound by a confidentiality process because I'm engaging in the consultations that Christian Porter has been conducting. Uh, and so I can't go into the detail of, of what's happening, except to say that I'm very happy with how he's handling it. And I think the government is heading in the right direction. That will both uh, give comfort to people of faith that their religious freedom uh, will be protected in Australia, but it, won't, it shouldn't alarm anyone else in the community that it's going to come at their expense. All right, well, we'll perhaps uh, delve into that when there is some more detail. I wouldn't want you uh, uh, divulging any confidences as you shouldn't. James Patterson, Very until kind, next Tom. time. Thank you.